Okay, time to round up today's world of top stories, that is, from the world of science and, and tech with uh, CTV science and technology expert Dan Riskin. Good to see you, Dan, on this Monday morning, and we begin with a topic Jen is really into, right? Yes, I'm really into this one, Dan. Uh, how, to, how to make a first impression that will make people like you. I am a self-admitted uh, people pleaser, always trying to, you know, don't hate me, please love me, please love me. It's exhausting. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is exhausting. And what I love about this is I just imagine a whole bunch of scientists who are like, well, we cannot make friends at parties. I think the solution is to do a research project on how to make friends at parties. So what they did is they got uh, about 130 people. Uh, this is in Germany, actually. They got 130 people and they did sort of a round robin quick, like just meet each other for a couple minutes and then write down some impressions of whether you like the person or not. And then they mm -hmm. looked at videos of those interactions to see what personality traits seem to correlate with people liking you. And they kind of say there's two different ways to be liked. One is that you're the life of the party and everybody's excited when you come into the room. Mm -hmm. And the other one is people really like you for who you are as individuals. And so you form like really strong relationships. And so what mm -hmm. they found from this study is that when you're big and loud and confident and boisterous, and you're also quite warm, you can be the life of the party. But to really get a, a person who really connects to you and really thinks they want to have a relationship with you, whether that's romantic or just a good friendship, mm -hmm. it's really that warmth that matters. That big, boisterous, loud thing doesn't really help with that side of things. So if you want to be the life of the party, have some confidence, get in there and just be loud, be proud, be yourself. Uh, also be warm, that's important. But for those special connections to really make a friend, it's the warmth that matters, not the loud, boisterous stuff. I guess okay. I'm just loud and boisterous hands, right? uh, because you add to that warmth, I'm the Jen. life of the party, but I have no real friends. You're warm. <laughs> you're, warm. Thanks, you're, you're, you're warm. warm. <laughs> you're warm to us, Jen, that's for sure. Okay, yeah. in the meantime, let's move on while Jen considers her warmth uh, sort of strategies here. <laughs> Can artificial <laughs> intelligence help weed out hate speech from social media because there's a little bit of that on social media, Dan, you may have noticed. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there is a little bit. This yeah. is where artificial intelligence might find its place. A lot of people are scared of AI because you know people are like, you know, pretending that writing that they got from AI is their own and there are all these issues that come up. But one of the things that humans are not doing well is controlling hate speech on social media. And what if artificial intelligence could do that? So uh, this is a new uh, engine that scientists have put forward. And what it does differently that other programs haven't done before is it doesn't just look at the tweet. It looks at the tweets that came before it and after mm. it to get a sense of the context. And they're saying that with this new technology, they can capture about 90, 92% hmm. of hate accurately. And so if you have something automated that can be doing it, that could give platforms like Twitter or other platforms a lot more power to weed out that hate as it happens quickly instead of sort of this reactive a couple weeks later, maybe we think about mm. banning you kind of stuff that they're doing right now. In the moment, yeah, sort of yeah, opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I wish we could get to the third one, but we're out of time, Dan. So uh, we'll save it for next, next week because I think it's a really good topic. Yeah, collaborative steering when yeah. it comes to self-driving cars. Yeah, for totally. sure. Okay, Dan, we'll try to pencil that one in for next <laughs> week as well. So thanks, Dan, for joining us. Well, it is time for Take Me Home Tuesdays. That's our segment that offers a great opportunity for animal lovers to help find some fluffy friends their forever home. And here with me this morning is Toronto Animal Services Manager Alana, Alana Trainoff with Labradoodle Puppies, Stella and Stevie, and also Jennifer Popowicz, who is a veterinary technician. Thank you so much for coming in. I must say, I think I'm in love already with these Labradoodles. They're about 11 weeks old. Uh, Alana, if you can talk about Stevie and Stella. Happy to. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for having us. Um, we're excited to bring them on this morning. They're they're very sleepy, so they're just they're not. Uh, I guess we're learning they're just not uh, not morning puppies. They um, they're 11 weeks. They are like you said, Labradoodle puppies. So they're um, part uh, lab and they're part standard poodle. We expect them to. They're pretty big mm -hmm. already at this right. age, um, and we expect them to uh, get. They can get anywhere to grow anywhere to between 50 and 90 pounds or so. Okay, yeah, that yeah. is big. And Stevie and Stella are brother and sister. They're brother and sister, if yes. If people want to adopt them, it, can they adopt them together or does it have to be apart or what's the process for that? They can be adopted mm -hmm. together. They're, they're bonded now, but they'll be totally fine on their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's a, a good home for them and somebody can only take one of them, that's totally fine. They'll be, they'll be uh, happily adopted separately. And what kind of home do you think would be good for either uh, Stevie and Stella? I think for these guys, I mean, they they look very relaxed right now, but right. they're still 11 week old puppies and they're going to be quite big. So, you know, um, a family that can um, 
give them the exercise that they need, the activity, the attention. Um, they're going to grow to be quite big, so they'll need lots of space mm -hmm. um, and just an active family that can give them, um, you know, a, a happy, a happy life. Yeah. So when you say active, that's kind of code for kids are okay, right? If yeah, you're a family with so. kids, they'll be okay with yeah, them. Yeah. They had a sleepover last night with Aww. a family that had two kids, and they uh -huh. cuddled right up to them, so they are totally fine with kids. And we don't know for sure how they are with cats, but so far they are pretty great all around. They are so sweet, <laughs> and I wish you know our viewers right now can you know touch your screen because they are extremely soft. They've got hair, so I know because they're part poodle, that makes them, I'm not gonna say hypoallergenic, but maybe some people with dog sensitivities or allergies might be okay with them because of that poodle mix, right? Yeah, I think so. We can't say for sure. We don't know what everybody's allergies yeah. are, but you know, they they don't shed much, so they, they'll they probably be okay. Okay, yeah. yeah, they're so soft and so sweet. Oh my gosh, this is, I think this is Stella. She looks like yes, she's totally is. relaxed right <laughs> yeah, now. She really is. Oh my goodness, she's having her nap. And yeah. Alana, today is also World Spay Day. Yeah. Uh, so what is Toronto Animal Services doing to mark this day? Well, you know, this is an important day for us. We um, obviously, uh, you know, promote spaying and neutering pets. And we have our program, uh, which is our SNP truck, which stands for Spay Neuter Your Pet. Mm -hmm. It's a 45 foot mobile veterinary clinic that we bring into communities all across the city. Um, and so for today, just as a, a way to celebrate this day, we're actually doing a bit of a fundraiser and asking people if they can to donate um, to, you know, to our services um, that we bring into communities because they're, they're, they're funded completely by donations. Oh wow, that's really important, yeah. especially in this time during the pandemic when we're seeing a lot of uh, animals that might be given up because people can't handle them anymore, so getting your animals uh, spayed and neutered. Definitely helps with the Super, population yeah. issue and with other health issues mm -hmm. and behavioral issues too. Okay, well, it was such a pleasure meeting Stevie and Stella. I think <laughs> they're for dozing off us. right now on the couch. They might not want to we'll leave. Have to carry them off. Set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Alana Trainoff and Jennifer uh, Popovich, thanks so much from Toronto Animal Services stopping by to bring Stevie and Stella. And people can just go to your website to try to find more information to adopt them, right? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Chances are you've heard many of their hit songs uh, from Body and much more, but Toronto and London, Ontario born DJ dance music duo Loud Luxury. They are back with some new music and this time featuring some heavyweight collaborators and their old school DJ friends DVBBS as well as country superstar Kane Brown. All this as they embark on a North American tour and a string of shows in Las Vegas. So Andrew Fedick and Joe DePache join us live now on CP24 Breakfast. Hello. So early Good from morning. LA. Thank you guys Good for morning. joining us. Uh, I know you've had a busy schedule and you were just playing in Mexico. Uh, so thank you for waking up because I know you guys are usually night owls. <laughs> but let's talk about this uh, new song next to you. It's really, you know, a project that was three years in the making, kind of a love letter to your old school roots, as well as a new collaboration with Kane Brown. So how did this come about, Andrew? Yeah. I mean, it's been years in the making, actually. Dubs had reached out to us because they'd written the track with Kane a while ago, and they were looking to do something different with it. So Joe and I got in the studio with them and produced the version that we were all really excited about. And we've been waiting three years for the green light from Kane Brown's team to finally put this out. And it's finally out in the world, and it's the best feeling ever. Wow. And Joe, how do you feel about it? When I first heard it, I was uh, hooked right away. The lyrics are great. It's got that country twang mixed with, you know, the dance beats. Uh, it's super special. I mean, this is something that we've been sitting on for a very long time. And, um, I mean, it's something that we've been playing for a lot of friends and family, and everybody's super excited about it. So the fact that we actually started working on it as the pandemic happened and it finally gets to see the light of day is like really, really special to us. Okay. And Andrew, you guys have uh, a new North American tour. You'll be coming to Toronto uh, in August, August 4th, I believe. But you also have a string of shows in Vegas. So talk about what it's been like. I mean, you guys are world famous DJs now after your diamond song uh, body kind of blew up in the world over a billion and a half streams. What's it been like? I mean, jet setting, traveling, uh, playing in Vegas, kind of living that life. Well, your your words, not mine, because <laughs> I still believe we have a lot of work to do. Uh -huh. But I think one of the most exciting things about what we do is the variety. No two days are alike. We're constantly traveling to different cities and we feed off of the energy of meeting all these different people around the world. And the one common thing that brings them together is music. And mm -hmm. that's a really powerful thing for us. 
Yeah, I've seen uh, photos and footage, uh, Joe, of you guys performing at Omnia Nightclub in Vegas. It looks like the party you want to be at with that giant chandelier in the middle of the room. Uh, Joe, you guys get pretty, you know, physical in your performances. Uh, you crowd surf. So how much of, you know, DJing and performing live is about reading what your audience wants? Because there's that moment when the bass drops and you're really kind of hitting this climax with the audience as well, right? Yeah, I mean, our shows are pretty physical. Um, we are definitely feed off the energy of the crowd. And fortunately, we play a lot of really amazing shows. Like you were saying, in Vegas, we play at Omnia. It's a world-class venue, uh, probably one of the best in the country and uh, North America. So uh, it's really one of those things where we have to stay fit. Like I'm working out every day and trying to stay healthy uh, to be able to keep up with the demand of touring constantly, going to different countries, going to different cities and playing sometimes multiple shows a day. Yeah, I can imagine that must be so physically demanding. So Andrew, does that mean uh, you guys are kind of, you know, holding off on, on the alcohol? I mean, I'm sure you get offered drinks all the time, but you kind of have to control yourselves, right? Well, it's certainly an interesting dichotomy being a party DJ and mm -hmm. being the life of the party, but also knowing that <clears throat> we're in this for the long haul. You know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten older and we've learned to control <laughs> ourselves. It's definitely a long way from the first shows we were playing back in the day. And we want to do this for 20 plus years. So we're going to keep doing it responsibly, but still having fun. That's what's most important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you guys still look super young and your success continues. So we can't wait to see you here August 4th when you play at Veld. And good luck. Congrats on the new music. We'll chat soon. Take Thank care. Thank you so much Thank for Thank you so us. much. We'll see you at Veld. All right. That is Loud Luxury, Andrew Fedick and Joe DePace joining us this morning. Well, Canada has launched the Sky Canada Project, a study planned to collect information to document rare natural phenomena. It's the first known official Canadian UFO research effort in nearly 30 years. So joining us this morning for more insight into this project are Humber College professors specializing in the study of conspiracy theories and also the co-hosts of the Uncover Up podcast, Nathan Radke and Lee Kunla. Good to have both of you on the program this morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, Lee, let me kick this off with you. The first official study into sort of potential UFOs or uh, uh, whatever they're calling them now. Aerial uh, phenomena. What yeah. does that UFOs. mean? UFOs. Right? Yeah, let's call them UFOs. Yes. I like that better. Everyone knows what we're talking exactly. about at that point. Mm -hmm. How significant is it that the government is really addressing this so publicly and really actually looking at it? Well, I think it is very significant, but um, it's not that new. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're in is what is technically known as a UFO flap. And that's where people flap? are seeing a flap, F-L-A-P-P. -P -P. Okay. That's the technical UFO nerd term, okay. but it's, it's a thing. And that's where people are seeing stuff in the skies. But the thing is, this has been happening historically for decades, and it tracks political and social uncertainty and fear. Uh -huh. Now, it is significant that we're looking into it now. It is a serious national mm -hmm. security issue, mm -hmm. but it's not quite as new as it might seem. Okay. Okay, interesting. And Nathan, let's turn to you now. So who will comprise this uh, new team to make up this project? Is it uh, the Canadian Space Agency, the Transport Ministry? Like, who's involved? And what exactly are they going to be trying to research to do? Well, I mean, it's interesting. Governments have been interested in UFOs for years. The big change now is that they're admitting this is a legitimate phenomenon. It was mm. before anybody who came forward to say that they had seen a UFO... There was a, a lot of stigma attached. Yeah. They say, no, no, this is legit. But because this is a pretty new thing, admitting that, they have to basically set this whole thing up from scratch. So there's a lot of questions about, okay, who do people report to? Mm -hmm. uh, how is that reporting done? What kind of responses are there? And so this isn't even a study into the UFOs. What we're having now is a study into how we can study the phenomenon uh. of UFOs. Okay, Even that, that acknowledgement, though, is really fascinating, right? Because, I mean, for so long, it's like, oh, Area 51, that's a no-go zone. Right. We don't talk about that. These lights that pilots have seen when they're flying, whether they're Air Force pilots, et cetera, Nathan, these things have happened as well. So just the fact that it's being addressed, I think, to me, really signals maybe an evolution in terms of attitudes. Is that fair to say? And that there's a credence being given to the stories now? Absolutely. And that is extremely significant. I mean, we're only going to be able to study this if we remove that stigma. And, and as Lee was saying, this is a legitimate phenomenon that has implications for national security. It has implications for passenger safety in airplanes. Like, this is an important thing that we need to be paying attention to. And hopefully this is 
maybe the first step in us giving it the attention that it deserves. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the word security, Nathan, but Lee, I want to ask you, why now? Why after so long when we've heard countless reports, I mean, I'm sure you guys covered in your uh, podcast, that they've decided to do this? Is it because of the recent news of the Chinese spy balloon and those other three identified uh, objects over the uh, North Atlantic? Um, I can only speculate, but I really think that that is a really plausible explanation for it. Um, the, the balloons, that was a quite unique event, although, again, historically, there have been more uh, precedents than, than we might imagine. I think going back a bit further to the TikTok, um, sorry, tic tac uh, mm -hmm. objects that uh, the Air Force uh, released, the Pentagon released mm -hmm. these videos mm -hmm. from 2004. Uh, Barack Obama then later uh, came on TV and said, you know, I don't know what these things are. I think that started to um, get the public more interested again in what's going on. And yeah, then I think the proximate event of the balloons, uh, the four that were just shot down in mm -hmm. February, I think that has really been the trigger to say, look, we got to look into this. And the United States has been further ahead in taking these phenomena seriously. And Canada really doesn't have a reporting system. Right. And are you finding, Nathan, before we kind of let you both go here, that this has really triggered more interest in the Uncover Up podcast? Because I'm sure this is plenty of fodder for yeah. what you and Lee discuss. Yeah. Well, one of the things we do is we put things in a historical context. And so we, right now, are looking at the phenomenon of alien abductions, things like the Betty wow. and Barney Hill abduction uh, in, the, okay. in the 1960s, to try to show that you know, this stuff isn't new. This has been going on for a long time, and we need to understand the history of it if we need to understand what's happening now. Right. Okay, fascinating stuff. Uh, very quickly, yes or no answer, do you believe in aliens and, you know, space, UFOs, all that kind of stuff? Okay, I believe that aliens exist in the universe, right. but they're not visiting us in UFO spacecraft. Gotcha. Got it. Nathan? <laughs> I believe in UFOs, but remember the U stands for unidentified. Right. Yeah. So Good I point. believe there's stuff in the sky and we don't know what <laughs> it is. We don't know what okay. it is. Nathan Rackey, you can look great to talk to you both of you from the Uncover Up podcast. Thanks for being here this morning. Thank Thanks you. for having All us. Right, of course, Thanks we have so been also asking you about this. We want to know, should we be paying more attention to UFOs in Canadian skies? So you can email us your answers to now at cp24.com or use the handle at cp24breakfast on Instagram or Twitter. And we'll try to share some of those responses with our viewers this morning. The biggest night in Hollywood is less than two weeks away, and we've been counting down the days with film critic Richard Krause and his list of Oscar-nominated movies that you can watch over the weekend. And so Richard is here uh, joining us remotely this morning to talk more about best costume design category. This is mm -hmm. an interesting one, uh, you know, because there are some really creative minds in Hollywood beyond script writers and directors and, you know, cinematography. Yep. Uh, Babylon, let's talk about mm -hmm. what they were wearing, I suppose, then in Babylon. Well, I wanted to talk about these movies because uh, these are some of the ones that we haven't had a chance to talk about in some of the other categories that we've uh, been detailing over the last number of weeks. So Babylon is the first one uh, here to talk about. And what makes this movie interesting is, uh, for me, it's an epic. It's three hours and 15 minutes long. Mm. It is completely uh, wild in its presentation. It's the story of young Hollywood uh, as it then shifts from silent movies into sound films. Uh, it takes a little break, then picks up again in the 1950s. So it covers a lot of uh, decades, a lot of generations. And with that, you get a lot of, obviously, a lot of different styles in the costuming. Uh, so you've got brilliant costumes that really are evocative of mm. the time and place uh, that they that the film is set in. But they're being worn by great actors like Margot Robbie and, and uh, uh, Brad, Brad Pitt, Pitt and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, so you've got uh, a film that I found wildly entertaining. People either love this movie or hate it. I'm on the love side of this, uh, but you cannot deny that it uh, that it looks fantastic. Definitely. And part of that is because of the beautiful costume design. And that's on Paramount Plus right now. Should you want to have a look at it? Yeah. Okay. Definitely on my on my list, Richard. And next up, we have a title mm -hmm. that rhymes. This is cute. Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. Yeah, and this is all about fashion, which makes it an obvious choice for best costume at the Academy Awards. This is the story of uh, a woman who is uh, a house cleaner, 
and she comes into a bunch of money in the 1950s, and she has always wanted a dress like the dress that she saw in one of the uh, apartments of the very rich people that she cleans houses mm. for. Uh, it's a Dior couture dress. And so when she has this windfall, she decides that she's going to leave London for the first time ever in her life and go to Paris, go to Dior, and get the dress made. Uh, and it's just a, a heartwarming story about uh, reaching out and finding your dreams and being able to touch your dreams, making mm -hmm. it happen. But then you've got these fantastic clothes in them as well. And all the stuff that happens in and around uh, the atelier of uh, Dior, you'll see some of the most phenomenal clothes here. So mm -hmm. this one has a good shot at winning the Academy Award. It's called Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris, and it's on Prime Video right now. Mm -hmm. All right, and before we let you go, Richard, we've got to talk about this. Four Oscar nominations, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, also featuring in this category. Yeah, best costume design here. So this is probably by far and away the biggest hit uh, of all the movies nominated here. Uh, but it's interesting when you uh, look at the clothing in this film, you have everything mm -hmm. from the kind of uh, formal wear that is uh, uh, worn at the funeral of T'Challa, the king of Wakanda. Um, that You've got the warrior's costumes. You've got this <clears throat> wide variety of work here from the costume designers that echo uh, some traditional, uh, uh, African clothing, but also if you uh, look, it's also got a lot of really kind of cool futuristic touches woven in there as well. So really imaginative, really beautiful, called Black Panther Wakanda mm -hmm. Forever, and you can see that on Disney Plus right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a stunning movie. I watched it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of great costume designs. All right, Richard Krauss, yeah. film critic. Always love chatting with you. Have a great weekend. We'll talk soon. Thank you.